Welcome to the Milk Marketing Order 33 update. Uh, this is Dr. Lawrence Jones with Farm Institute. And I'm preparing this specifically for Nobis AgriScience in uh, conjunction with Balchem. And I'm recording this on January 26, 2022. So there's been a lot of discussion about what is going to go on with milk prices and uh, what kind of what's going on uh, you know, overall. And so to help understand this, uh, last time uh, I presented this to you, I think I put together this blend price, which is the average of class three and four. So what I did was I mirrored on top of that the order 33 statistical uniform price, but I did adjust this for fat and protein. So this should be more in line with what you're receiving you know, on farm. Now that does not include premiums or hauling or anything like that. So it'd be considered the pay price. And when you look at these, and I only went back to January of uh, 2021 because I didn't want to look at the pandemic times, but the pay price is just about $2.17 over this blend uh, price. Now, there are times when it's a little wider and a little uh, narrower uh, for you guys because you do a bunch of deep pooling. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So the big question that everybody's asking right now is we're doing our budgets. How should we budget for 2023? And so right now, my recommendation to everybody is you should budget for about $4 a hundred weight underneath of where you were in 2022. So whatever you received, you know, if it was 23, 24, then, uh, you know, take that uh, $4 off of it. And this is what the graph kind of looks like uh, for the next 12 months. So we look at your uh, statistical uniform prices last uh, milk check, which was uh, for December. It was about 94 cents below where it was the previous month. And that was at 21.81 with a PPD of $1.31. And if we look at historic numbers, again, I don't want to argue that these are good or bad. They're just historic. You know, we were always in at uh, $18.50, $19, you know, all the way back here, you know, to the end of 2021. And it was this big rise up that uh, really got the industry in a kickstart here. And now it's it's trending down. And if we compare, you know, this next 12 months, uh, that's where we got to take off that $4. Now, part of the question with you guys is the de-pooling. And so here are the classic uh, historical numbers for your uh, utilization. Right now you're depooling most of class four. And I'll show you in a minute that you're probably going to stop doing that and actually begin depooling class three. And that's all driven on the relative prices. So the rule of thumb is a 75 cent different, uh, whatever one higher you're gonna depool. So all the way through probably March, uh, class four, which is in the orange, class three is in the blue. Uh, they're going to be deep pooling, you know, up here, uh, the class four, take it out of the pool, get a separate milk check. Uh, that's a topic for another discussion. But after about April, it looks like class three is going to be higher. So that's the point that then you'll begin uh, switching around and deep pooling class three. So if we look at the statistical uniform prices uh, that came out in December, you guys were 21.81. Uh, the high was Florida 27.05, and you know most of them were in that 22 to you know 23 range. And where I'm at in the Northeast, we're about 23.06. But again, there is a big difference between these two orders because you're our uh, base plus two dollars, and this is base plus 3.25. Uh, so there's a dollar twenty-five difference, and, and that's kind of what you see in that difference in statistical uniform prices. Now, for the Northeast, that's all taken away at the county level, so it's not like that's a dollar twenty-five higher. And what's important to me is to look at the change. Uh, so last month we had class one came down a lot, came down a dollar fifty-one. Class three was down, you know, about half a dollar, and class four was down a dollar eighteen. And so you guys were down 94 cents. Now the East Coast was down a lot more because they're a much higher uh, class one utilization that's at this group down here. Now the Northeast is kind of a, a what I would call a blend of everything. We're, we're not strong in anything. We've got a little bit of everything. Uh, some of the areas uh, didn't come down nearly as much. Minnesota, Wisconsin, 
you know, they were uh, very, very high, like 80% class three. And in some of these areas that are higher class four would have been uh, a little bit, a little bit uh, better numbers. Now, one of the things that we can get from the uh, federal milk marketing orders is how milk production changed. And uh, this was actually kind of exciting, this last uh, data that we got, because we said that from this data, we expected milk production to be up about 0.84%. And in fact, we got the USDA data, and we were up 0.4%. So uh, very, very close uh, agreement here. So there is the reality that we can use these federal milk marketing orders to kind of estimate what the USDA is going to come out with. Now, the other thing that uh, we can always look at is what percent of the milk is in the federal orders. There are two things that drive this. And so for this month, it was 70%. That's up just a couple percent from typical. It's more in the you know mid to high 60s. And it's combination how much milk is out here that's not in a federal order you know idaho does not have a federal order or how much is being depooled uh you know by people uh, in different regions and it's always fun to kind of look at this graph which is the change year over year now i don't particularly like year over year numbers uh, they're not terribly useful for me but if we again we look at uh michigan you guys are up about point one percent uh, the ones that were down the most would have been new mexico the cows kind of went into texas florida lost a few and uh washington lost uh you know 3.3 percent uh, not sure what happened in washington other than they've had just really crappy weather here for quite a long time so the cow numbers did just come out uh actually yesterday uh so they came out at 9,400,000. The USDA really reduced the cow numbers, you know, all the way back to about last August. Uh, they brought them down a little bit. And uh, we've been more or less constant. Now, this last uh, month would have suggested that we lost a bunch of cows. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but that's what the data is showing us, that we lost about 16,000 cows across these uh, two months. But... For me, 9.4 million is about the right number, way below this uh, peak that we had in 2021, and, and still a little bit below the peak that we had in 2018. Again, these were the really good milk prices down here in 2019. Before we go away from this, we'll look at the milk per cow. Uh, so the red dots are december and again this is uh total milk divided by total cows so this would be include the dry cows in this and as you see we've been on about a one percent annual growth but our december number came in really close to where we thought it would be uh, normally december is up from november it did come up we were not very far from trend line and so you know from my perspective the herd was doing exactly what we expected it to do Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on with the slaughter numbers. And so we've been, you know, right at the 60 plus or minus, particularly if you look at the four-week average. Uh, the numbers jumped up a little bit this last week uh, for the 7th of January. And uh, one of the questions is, is there some Canadian animals coming down and getting slaughtered in the U.S.? Uh, this report would not uh, separate that out. But if some of the Canadian animals are coming down, uh, then this number could be skewed a little bit. But from my perspective, we've been really stable right at about 60,000 on a four-week average. And I always like to take uh, these numbers and just put them back on a call rate uh, because, you know, 60,000 on 9.4 million is a whole lot different than 60,000 on 9.5 million. So putting these back on a percentage basis to me is really the only way to look at it. And I drew this line in here between 32 and 34 percent call rate. Uh, normally, I expect six to seven percent uh, death loss. Uh, we add that to the call rate; it's going to get us around a 40 percent call rate. That says we need about 0.8 heifers for every cow. And uh, the herds I look at, they're running really close to that. Uh, we'll get heifer numbers from USDA here in a couple of weeks to help uh, pull that together. But when I was looking at this, this was kind of interesting because I, I put together the actual cow numbers that are, are now on USDA relative to uh, what the slaughter numbers were. And you can see we were increasing in cow numbers from about April 
on through to about October, look at this call rate. You know, that's the only time that we were below 30%. And then it's really uh, came back down uh, these last couple uh, months, and this is where we are up here. So I think this call rate can actually kind of tell us if we're gaining or losing cow numbers. When we're below this red box, I suspect we're gaining, and when we're above it, uh, we we'll suspect we're not. Now, these uh, outliers here are holidays. This is Thanksgiving, and here is uh, New Year's and Christmas. This is an interesting graph I pulled together uh, this last week. So what I did is pulled the rolling production of cheese, and that's pretty easy. We get cheese production every month. But rolling disappearance is much harder to calculate because we've got uh, exports, we have domestic demand, we have carryover. And so what I end up doing is just doing a 12-month rolling uh, number that's you know, very much like your rolling herd average. You uh, add this month, drop off a month uh, 12 months ago. And for cheese disappearance, it's we made it. It either went in cold storage or we didn't. And then, then it disappeared if it didn't. And so what's interesting is whenever the black line, which is the production, is over top of the blue line, that says cold stocks ought to be uh, increasing. Right now, we've really kind of come into a point where we're right on top of each other. And then uh, what I did with this, I said, okay, over the last 12 months, you know, what is our demand for cheese? What is our ratio of cheese to milk? You know, what kind of milk do we need? What kind of milk are we getting per cow? And we get all done, we pop out at 9.399 million. Well, that's pretty close to 9.4 million to me. So what this is saying is that 9.4 million cows is probably pretty close to what we need to uh, meet the demand of cheese. Now, just because we met the uh, demand of cheese this last year doesn't mean we will meet it this next year because there's real concern that demand is coming down. I'm not uh, quite in the same camp as a lot of people of saying that the demand is being destroyed. I just think uh, things are slowing up a little bit, but uh, actually I think we're still moving ahead at a fairly good clip. So here are your cheese stocks. Uh, again, here are the December numbers. Uh, we're pretty much on an annual growth of almost 3%, which is not sustainable. We just can't keep adding uh, to the freezer at that. We've been coming down. And the question that I've been asking people is what role does interest rates have on how much cheese are uh, companies willing to hold? Because as interest rates go up, uh, you know, it's going to be less likely to want to hold uh, cheese. We've got one point. 5 billion pounds of cheese in cold storage. I mean, multiply that by $1.80 and you uh, realize that there's a fair amount of money tied up in this cold storage. If we look at the uh, fat values, uh, you guys are at uh, 4.16. And if we look across everything this last month, we were 424. That's just an amazing number to me. And fat was up about 1% uh, over last month. Even Florida is 378, but uh, almost everybody, you know, is over 4%. The Northwest is very strong at 4.6. And so you guys had 4.16 a year ago. You had 4.12. So you came up, you know, four ticks on that. And again, you know, you're continuing to increase components. The highs are getting higher, the lows are getting higher. So very good on fat test on order 33. And you might expect that. So this is a graph of fat price. Again, for the 12 months, here are the lows that we've seen in the futures. Here are the highs that we've seen. We're right in the middle. But more importantly, a number that we typically use for fat is anything over $2 is usually pretty good. And uh, so we're running numbers clear up here, you know, 270, 280. So we're going to continue to expect uh, fat in milk and we're going to expect, uh, you know, fat percentages to keep coming up. And what's driving that is butter. Uh, so these are as of last Friday. And here's the spot market. Uh, butter in the spot market is just pretty flat. It's only uh, bouncing between 232 and 243. And the futures contracts are actually pretty flat, too. They came down two cents. 
Uh, but again, you know, we're looking at, you know, 240, 250, 260, somewhere in there for butter. Protein is also pretty strong. You guys are 331. And uh, the Northwest is, again, a very strong at 36, basically. And you're right at the same value you were last year. So no big change in uh, protein. Uh, and again, you know, we're, we're still making, you know, kind of upward trends and uh, the highs and the lows. So I expect this to continue up a little bit. But I'm not surprised that we're not seeing protein come up nearly as much as butter. Because, again, the number we talk about is $3. And uh, we're going to be below that $3 for quite a while. So protein is not nearly as uh, profitable as what uh, fat is at this point. And it's not uh, going to hit that $3 until probably you know, late 2023. And what's driving that is cheese. Uh, we're on the spot market. The uh, blocks have been trending down. The barrels have been trending now. Now they came up a little bit today, and we'll talk about the variability in a minute. And here are the highs that we've seen in the contracts, and we're at the lows. Uh, we've hit several new lows with cheese, and it was down two cents this last week. Here is the uh, daily spot cheese. So this is the average of blocks and barrels plus uh, one and a half cents. And, and what is going on is right in the middle of October, something really changed, really changed the variability. And, you know, we've had very low lows, very high highs, low lows, low lows, highs, highs. And right now we broke through support at $1.80. Now today it came up just a little bit and, uh, this is actually uh, today's uh, uh, spot market, so we're right at that support level. It's always good to stand back and ask what's going on, you know, globally, because we are in a global market. And uh, overall, we've been down in the global market. These are session over session numbers. Uh, last one was basically flat at uh, down only uh, 1%. So things have been coming down. I like to put everything into U.S. dollars. So we've got butter at about a dollar ninety-eight. That's much lower than our butter at two thirty-six. So we're not uh, competitive on the world market. Cheddar's at two twenty-one uh, blocks or a dollar ninety-six. So there's lots of discussion. We're not competitive on the world market, and part of that is I think it takes probably about thirty cents to uh, get cheese offshore and into that world market. Non-fat dry milks at a dollar. 37 spot market is a dollar 20 it was actually down uh, today a little bit even more and it's always about a 20 cent difference between our spot and the uh, global trade because if we're very much in a global market for that whole milk part is the one that's really down it's a dollar 46 it didn't change this week but basically you take that and you multiply it by 10 because there's 10 pounds of uh, solids and 100 pounds of milk you get a world price of around 1461. Uh, so we're not going to participate in that. Uh, we're not going to be making uh, whole milk powder and selling it on the world market for $1.46. It's just not going to happen in the U.S. right now. Class three equivalents came up about 80 cents, and that was because of that eight cent increase in cheese. Class four came down a little bit, but overall, this uh, global trade uh, looked like it was in our favor about 37 cents. And the thing that's really driving this uh, non-fat dry milk is the global trade. So these are the spot values. Uh, the blue is the actual global dairy trade with a 20 cent uh, discount. And you can see uh, right here, we're right back at that discount. Uh, we're just hanging in there. There are lots of times that we are that, and, and there are other times when we're even below uh, the world market. But right now, we're right at that 20 cent discount to the global dairy trade. And that's what's driving down uh, class four because over here on the right is non-fat dry milk. We've got all sorts of new lows uh, on that. You know, there were some really good highs, but we've lost all those now. And that is exactly the same trend that we have on class four. Uh, it's all in all sorts of new lows now. And, you know, look at these highs that we'd had uh, previously. And this came down four cents and this came down 43, which is, uh, again, there's an eight or nine cent uh, a ratio between non-fat dry milk and class four. 
All right, I look at uh, grains for just a little bit, and this is of last Friday, uh, but I think uh, it's going to hold true yet this week. Uh, the big deal is soybean meal came down about $26, and these are 12 month rolling numbers. And our protein energy index, which is eight pounds of corn meal, eight pounds of soybean meal, uh, came down 10 cents, and we're at 258 uh, on that at this point. And it's interesting to look at these 12-month uh, rolling averages. So here is corn. Uh, we're very much range-bound, 220, 240. Uh, there's lots of discussion today about, uh, you, you know, what's going to happen with these contracts, especially when we get in the new crop corn. And then uh, soybean meal has been in this 390, 420. We had a big blip here with that EPA report, but we're back. We're back into this range right now. So... Uh, these crops are not uh, moving up quite as fast as everybody thought they would. I think we're just in a in a sideways trade on on all of these, more so on corn than on soybean meal. So there are a couple of things that are driving this, and I'm going to just touch on these real quickly. The Brazilian crop is probably getting smaller for both corn and uh, soybeans. You know that was held out as just a monster crop. It's going to be huge, but it's getting smaller by the day. Argentina's uh, crop is probably getting bigger. They've got a tremendous amount of, of rain these last couple of weeks. Now, I want to touch on this issue because I think it's going to impact the Midwest and you guys in Michigan uh, probably as much as anything. We hear a lot about El Nino, and the question is, when is it going to become the dominant uh, feature in weather, and how long is this La Nina going to uh, stay around? And the way that we measure La Nina is this cold water off the west coast of South America. And that's the uh, cold water is signified by blue there. And so I gave you this from the 4th of November. And if we compare that now to this last one on the 20th, I mean, this is beginning to fade. There's not nearly as much blue. And again, we can go back, you know, look at all this blue in through here. And then that's basically, you know, all gone. And it, But... The La Nina is driven by trade winds that are going to the west, and they're still there. And so this time of year, it's surprising to have this strong of a La Nina. So here is the uh, kind of the million-dollar question that everybody is uh, trying to answer right now, is if we stay in La Nina, which is minus a half degree temperature for a little while, and then we do not get into El Nino, which is plus half a degree, then we might be set up into a scenario where the major teleconnection in the weather provides a significant drought in the Midwest and, and in Michigan. And so right now, if we look at the Climate Prediction Center, they're basically saying we're not going to get El Nino you know, anytime between August, September, October, or September, October, November. Uh, so it could be very, very late in the year before this El Nino takes hold. And the issue with all of this is El Nino tends to bring a lot of rain in the Midwest, making good crops in uh, the Midwest and Michigan. A What they call Enso neutral, so in no man's land here, or in a La Nina tends to bring a drought. And so we're just waiting to, to kind of see how quickly this La Nina fades and whether we can uh, get you know, it is El Nino fast, which, you know, this model suggests, or whether it's going to be a bit slower. And my, my money right now is on a bit slower, so it means we could have a very dry, hot uh, summer in the Midwest. And there's one analyst who is following something he calls the 89-year uh, cycle, and we're exactly 89 years from the Dust Bowl, and he's saying this, this could turn into that kind of a scenario. Just a couple things, because it does impact all of this, is the U.S. dollar index. Again, this is from Friday, but it's a, a basically is right in that uh, 101 today. We need this at 92 to 96 uh, for really strong exports. This really ran up in October to that 113, 114, but it's been coming down. And uh, again, there's some uh, indications that this might be coming down even further. So getting to this 92, 93, 94 is going to really help export dairy. It's also going to help export uh, grains, which is going to make grains more expensive uh, for dairies. 
And one of the last things uh, that's getting a bit of attention today is uh, the diesel index. And this is the home heating oil, which is low sulfur diesel. And I was listening to uh, a gentleman from Stone X who was looking at this. Now, this did come down today to about 340, but he thinks that this could easily pop up to $4, uh, you know, by late spring. And so his recommendation was to, you know, dairymen and uh, anybody doing crops should be looking at booking at least a portion of their diesel cost to make sure that we're not going to, you know, go way up to that $4. And it's going to be a lot predicated on what happens in Ukraine and Russia and whether there's going to be a big offensive, you know, and uh, get back to this war premium again. Okay, uh, that's it for me. And uh, I hope uh, this was at least a bit useful in helping you kind of think about what you're going to do for budgeting this year and what your risk might be. So until next time, uh, I'll get you more information.